everyone, welcome to Digital Charcuterie. I'm James. Joining me today is Andrew. Thank you all so much for coming along to talk the Batman with us. If you're new, give us a like, or if you're not new, give us a like, give us a subscribe if you're new. And a special shout out and thank you to all of the subscribers as of late. It's been awesome and it's kind of blowing my mind. So thank you so much for joining us here on Digital Charcuterie where we talk everything and anything and every once in a while we like to have discussions like we are going to have now and as i said earlier joining me is andrew fantasia famed author and actor andrew fantasia google him google me you might not like what you see but google me anyway uh, this is an interesting topic we've got today and i'm almost a little bit afraid that i'm out of my depth uh that you should have asked for a smarter guest to come on here with you but i'm going to do my best james yeah, we're going to talk about the villains of the Batman because I thought they were I I really like the villains in the Batman and I really like the villains in other Batman films as well, but the Batman was different. It was very I mean, aside from its dark and gloomy and noir, it was very different from even the MCU in a lot of ways that people aren't necessarily thinking about, I don't think. I don't think people are are like everyone's focusing on how it's dark and gritty and 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 folk and real world driven and whatnot, right? Whereas for me, the biggest difference between them, and I think, you know, the title of this video will be what the Batman does better than Marvel, but that's not really the case. That's not really what we're trying to say. It's different from Marvel because what we're going to talk about is how Marvel has used their movies to establish their heroes. Mm -hmm. like, so that's, so the villains in the Marvel movies, for the most part, and I think, you know, most people would agree, they take a backseat to the heroes, which is not something that we've seen that often, especially in the DC films, especially not with Batman movies where, you know, Jack Nicholson's Joker took set, like he was front and center. That's his movie is that a night Batman movie, Catwoman, Penguin. I mean, everybody loves Jim Carrey's Riddler. Tommy Lee Jones is doing his best Joker as two face. And the <laughs> list goes, the list goes on, right? Like the villains are usually, I mean, let's talk about Heath Ledger's Joker, right? The, creme de la creme of them all center stage and then like i said the mcu they let their heroes take a back seat but andrew in the batman there's something different going on there is there's a, a a shuffling of priorities with these guys because along comes riddler and penguin and catwoman and yes i'm lumping catwoman in with the villains because that's how she started so she kind of has to be put in the separate category of her own uh, but these people come along and they are on an even playing field with Batman. And we haven't seen that before. We haven't seen this sort of like a, a portrait where the, these characters are just sort of building one another up arc wise. But that's what happens here. Without Riddler being how he is. We don't get the Batman that we get at the end of the movie. Without Catwoman being how she is, we don't get the Batman we get at the end of the movie. They are literally running arm in arm from opening credits to closing credits. And that's never been done in any of these films. Maybe Dark Knight came close, but that was still just about, hey, look how the Joker is. Whereas Batman took a back seat, and this one nobody's sitting in the back seat. This is all front seat driving, James. It is a, a stretch limo, but it's horizontal, and everybody's sitting in the front. It's a strange car, and I wouldn't want to be in it, but that's what we're looking at. It's an uh, it's an ensemble for sure, and it's I mean, but it it's very Batman driven. Whereas again, uh, I mean, it's an ensemble, but Batman is definitely the leader of that ensemble, and we've never really seen Batman as the lead in one of these movies before like i said he's always kind of taking that back seat to the villains and like you said this one it they use the villains as as the origin story for the character but they use the smarts and the characteristics of these villains to lead into the batman it's kind of i thought it was a brilliant brilliant portrayal of, of all like the whole universe colliding for this to work out in that pieces of the riddler were needed to be into bruce wayne and everybody was in this a necessity to the overall story and to the overall character that is the Batman, not at the beginning of the movie, but the Batman at the end of the movie, which is the Batman that all of us have grown to love over the years, you know, because he starts off as vengeance. And I, look, Penguin calls him vengeance. Catwoman calls him vengeance. Everybody refers to this guy as vengeance. They know Batman as vengeance. 
and by the end of the movie he's hope right he's chase and and when at the end of the movie even you see that while he's helping the citizens of gotham they don't trust him altogether because they view him the way they view the riddler the way they view catwoman not that they know catwoman or penguin the way they view the not so the guy with the weird onion mask which i want for <laughs> halloween that he they view batman in the same light as that as as someone who who is vengeance and then he kind of has to show them no he's the opposite of of that and he learned he's the opposite of, of that through the actions of the villains and and you know like the mcu like we said it doesn't there's no folk the focus isn't on the villains so much there are moments of obviously there are moments like thanos has moments with gamora where they kind of push they're they're, they're right there but this one went above and beyond to do that and in a way andrew that didn't detract from the batman as a character no never once did it detract from the batman and it worked so well uh i mean the fact that so many people are still talking about it right now is a testament to it. It worked so well. It has taken the world by such a positive storm that now I can't help but wonder, are we going to see this become a trend? Uh, and it, it might be, you know, we might have turned a corner here. If you think about the way these things were laid out from the beginning of superhero stuff coming to cinema, right? So well, I guess that would be like Superman, Christopher Reeves, right? So if we start at that point, um, from that point up until MCU, you have like a very basic structure of simply just put what's popular on screen because the novelty is seeing it on screen for the first time. So when it comes to adapting the villains, it's just like, okay, you have a Superman movie, who's the most popular villain? Lex Luthor, put him on screen. You have a Batman movie, who's the most popular? Joker, put him on screen. Spider-Man, Green Goblin, put him on screen. X-Men, Magneto, etc. Like it was just about who is the number one bad guy. In Joker's case, that was literally a line in the movie. And then they just put it on screen and say like, wow, isn't it neat that you're seeing Magneto in a movie theater right now? Isn't that wild? Then you turn a corner with MCU because like you said, MCU didn't put any focus on the villains. It wasn't about, you know, it's not like how the, the 90s Batman movies were where every time a new one came out, it was all about, wow, we're going to get to see Two-Face on screen, isn't that wild? Instead, they turn this corner and now it becomes character pieces about the heroes and their approach to whatever bad guy they would put in is just like, it can be the most obscure person, you know, Obadiah Stane. Yeah, he's going to be our villain in this benchmark Iron Man movie. Nobody's heard of him. Who cares? We'll do our best to make him as interesting as possible, but it's not about saying, look at this villain finally on screen for the first time you've all been waiting for it's just about trying to tell a good story. And that has been their, their their kind of bread and butter. Like to this day, there are very few like classic, memorable, world-renowned MCU villains. And that kind of bled into other films as well. But now we're turning this third corner. And I can't help but wonder if this is going to start a new trend where everything becomes more ensemble. Uh, and James, can you see that happening with co like currently existing franchises, or do you think new ones will start and adopt this method? Like, I don't will think MCU do this. I MCU could. I don't think they necessarily will, only because the MCU, as great as it's been, is like it's it's hero focused, and the reason why it's hero focused is, with the exception of Spider Man they don't have a Batman or Superman. Like Spider-Man is the most, arguably the most popular superhero in the world. But mm -hmm. next to him is Batman and next to him is Superman. And Iron Man, now you could argue, I mean, let's say that was 2007, okay? Now obviously things have changed and Iron Man is up there. But Iron Man's dead, spoilers. So I, I think when you're dealing with a Shang-Chi or Eternals, it's tough to go that route because they want to establish who these characters are. They're like, who are these heroes and why should you care about these heroes? So every time Marvel comes up with a Moon Knight, you know, for the newbies, which there are a lot of them, they've got to be like, this is why you like this guy. This is why you like Captain Marvel. This is why you like Ms. Marvel. This is what, like, it's about them, not about the villains. But when you have the Batman, you have the thing that's unique about that is you have a character who we've seen on screen, like James Bond, a bazillion times. People seem to always want to go back to see Batman, but how do you make him different now? Because he's been grounded in reality. He's been goofy and playful. He's been animated. He's been everything you can. 
so how what do you do differently and what you do is you create villains that don't exceed the the character of the batman you make them work into the plot of the batman and they were it was so organic in the way that they utilized every movement that they had to create a more interesting superhero because dc's problem has always been for you know the the 90s specifically was they didn't know how to make their heroes interesting even like and i've brought this up so many times on the channel when ben affleck was offered uh batman matt damon had that interview and he goes well batman's not really acting it's bruce wayne it's like okay but why can't batman be acting like why is batman second fiddle to bruce wayne honestly i know everyone's like oh but bruce wayne is that's i don't care about bruce wayne. i don't go <laughs> to watch it for bruce wayne think like everyone's like this is the first batman movie where bruce wayne doesn't go to a a ball and wear a suit great <laughs> I don't need yeah. like every time that happens in any movie. I'm like, okay, we can move on from this. I've seen like, you know, it's like, Oh, we're doing this again. Is penguin going to show up in his rubber ducky. Like that's where we've been. It's happened. And it's, I think when they've done it, it has worked, but this one didn't need it. And it didn't need it. And the villains played into it, not needing it. And I thought Catwoman not being Catwoman. I'm going to do a video on this on the channel later is I think is going to be a phenomenal twist for bruce wayne going forward when she becomes catwoman because she's teetering on that and she's going to go full catwoman eventually and i can't wait to see that i think the way they handled that and the way the penguin you know we're going to see the power vacuum of gotham soon andrew with the penguin and the demise of falcone but it's not just the demise it's the fact that he was the rat like there's so many levels to that and all of those levels like they end and they begin and end with Bruce Wayne. They end with Batman and, and that all played into him as a character. Falcone was there to serve the Batman. Penguin was there to serve Falcone who serves the Batman, right? Catwoman was there to get to Penguin to get the Falcone to serve the Batman. Everyone was there to get to the Batman. And I just loved how they did all that. And obviously the Riddler, there's no secret. His whole ploy was to get to the Batman because he thought him and Batman were on equal playing terms. And then obviously, which is, I, I, it might be one of the weakness, weaker points of the movie when he's like, no, I mean, it's great acting, but when he's like, it's not, <laughs> like, I'm like, I've, my, I have a few, that was one that when I really think about it, I'm like, I've seen that scene before in a million movies. I, you know, come with a villain. I, I like that he needed to get caught so he would be safe from the flooding. But I think going forward, we can also nix the uh, villains getting, <laughs> getting caught halfway through the movie but that that's just i just love that they utilize the villains in a way that we've never seen before and that's not taking anything away from the mcu i'm like because they're hero those are hero driven movies and you can tell they're hero driven movies by the bright lights and you know robert downey jr having a shawarma that's how you can <laughs> they're very they're very different but it's a different story structure and i'm okay with it and I love the way they did it. I think the closest MCU might have come was honestly in No Way Home. Willem Dafoe's Goblin was just, I mean, if he had more screen time and was an actual character and not just thrown in from the multiverse, because his perfor it's his performance is just so, I mean, he's great and obviously Spider-Man 1 and Spider-Man 2. But uh, that's, that might be, I mean, Thanos is Thanos. He's a special villain also. I don't think he's a great villain, but he's a special villain because, you know, he snaps. <laughs> that's not a metaphor he snaps no, he really um, snaps. Well, and that's been one of the things that i've loved that marvel does that i really appreciate is that they can take these characters and make them household names and now people know the name thanos now people know the name eric killmonger and they're like wow yeah those are those are great villains and it's like nobody was talking about them 15 20 years ago nobody cared even people who read those comics probably stopped caring so that has been a beautiful trend that I have zero issue with at all. But I love this new idea, too, of just a different flavor of movie, a different flavor of comic book movie. And for all those directors, all the Scorseses and Coppolas of the world who like to complain about all these Marvel movies ad nauseum, um, first of all, you guys are making the same Mafia movie 25 times in a row. So where are you coming from? Second of all, um, the idea that these are not just cookie cutter things. These are coming in all different shapes and sizes, and this is a new shape and size. So I want to see more of that. And I'm really, really thirsty to know how they're going to do that in a sequel, because the question now becomes, and I don't know how much Matt Reeves had planned, right? I don't know if 
sequel plans were ever in the big picture or not. But how do you do this in a part two and possibly even a part three? Like, what is Batman's arc going to be? Because that's going to be a necessity. That's what's going to make or break this formula. Is in part two, if part one was about him stopping, you know, going from vengeance to protector, what's part two about? How does he, what does he need to do? How does he need to grow? And how do Hush or the Court of Owls or whoever end up being the villain get him there? Because without that formula, then you're just trying to recreate this recipe. And I have a feeling that's going to just be doomed before it starts. You know what I mean? So like, what could his, his struggle be, James? What could we be looking at? That I think that was one of the concerns going into the Dark Knight Rises was the Dark Knight has that beautiful ending where he's like, you, I've got this has to be pinned on me. Like the dense stuff, that's got to be pinned on me. And it's kind of the flip reverse of, of the Batman. And I think that it is tough to say, like Matt Reeves is throwing in Hush and Mr. Freeze and then obviously Court of Owls is something that keeps getting thrown in there. Court of Owls is one that they, I don't know what the arc would be for Batman at this point. There has to be one. He has to get from here to there. And I'm sure I'll do my research in the coming months and we'll figure that out. We'll crack the code of what's to come. But there's going to be something. I, I think, Andrew, what they're going to need to do is there's a scene in the Batman where Alfred almost dies. And he says, I've lost the most important people to me. I can't lose you too. There's a moment there. And I think they've got to, I think they have to uh, skip over Dick Grayson. Just forget Dick Grayson and then go right to Jason Todd. Mm -hmm. And you bring in Jason Todd. Yeah. Here's what I'm thinking. You bring in Jason Todd and like partway, partway through the second movie, or even in the third movie, you get the Joker to kill him. But the Joker is not your main bad guy ever. And if he's and if he's this happens in the third movie, Joker's not even in the second movie. Like Joker is like a little nothing criminal who just causes problems. But he cause but so my idea would be that Bruce Wayne, Batman, whoever would have to have a relationship with Jason Todd, and then he would have to lose Jason Todd to to this random crazy criminal. Obviously, there's a bigger threat. Court of Owls, whatever, is at hand. But that, to me, is the arc that you need to get him to the next step. Is Now he has to deal with this one big fear that he has. So the next fear is what he has to overcome. And that's why I love Dick Grayson, but you got to, for story's sake, you got to push him aside. You go Unless you want to kill Dick Grayson. But I don't think, you know, Zack Snyder did that. And of all the Snyderverse things people uh, weren't a fan of, that was probably number two. So I think, <laughs> and I love the Snyderverse, but I think you do that. I think that's your arc is you go there and you just you kill off a kid. It's tough to say. I mean, I don't see them not, I don't see them being afraid to do something like that. I also, I know Matt Reeves has actually toyed at the idea of Robin, but I don't see him, I, I don't see that happening right away. But I do think for me, that is, that could be his next, that's how you set up his next arc is the loss of a friend, an adopted son, someone he considers an adopted, something like that along those lines, to a criminal that he's put behind bars before and somehow got out and was able to do this within the larger story. Yes, and that's a great point. I never even thought of that. Because uh, that you're right, that's something that hasn't happened to him yet. At least, you know, never mind his parents, just like as an adult, to lose somebody close to him. So what does that do to him? What kind of path does it put him on? And more importantly, what kind of juicy goodness do we, the audience, get out of that path? And if, if the, the main villain is somebody who can reflect that, who can reflect the idea of the loss has made me darker, you know, who, who can do the same thing to him that Riddler did to him in Freeze. this one? Perfect. Hey, yeah, there you go. Freeze. Mr. Freeze. Yeah, you just cracked it. <laughs> Freeze would give him that because of his wife. I think, look, he's vengeance because he doesn't want anyone else to suffer the fate that his parents suffered. And that's why he does the way the thing he does. Now he's going to give up on that to show the hope. And once he does that, you know, things are going to start to slip. So I, I just, I think there's, there is possibilities. I don't know where they're going to go with it. This is my hope and my dream is that they cast it Jason Todd. I also hope we never find out. I hope I don't know until I watch the movie if there is a character like that in there. But again, though, you put Jason Todd in the movie, the problem is, is like when Stacy in a movie, you know where that character's heading. Mm -hmm. But I think they could do it in a way where we know where the character's heading, but you'd never, don't tease us down that path. 
and then have it happen organically. That's the best way to go about it. Because again, though, you know, like watching this movie, I mean, I guess you don't know, but they kind of told you like Penguin's not going to die. Catwoman's not going to die in this Riddler. We didn't know, I guess, but we knew that they weren't going to die going into these movie, this movie because they told us there's a Penguin show coming, maybe a Catwoman show. There's more to explore with those characters and they're not quite those characters that we know and love yet. So I think they could do that with the Jason Todd where you get someone and maybe he never even becomes a Robin. You know, maybe it's, maybe there's more to what's going on, but I think that's a perfect, I think that's a way to utilize it, have Batman's arc go further. And then again, you want Mr. Freeze in there and there's your juxtaposition with the villain. And if they only give him one ice pun in the movie, James, what's it going to be? <laughs> Uh, I think it should be what killed the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's definitely going to be chill out. I, I do hope if they do bring Mr. Freeze in, if you remember, there's a great scene in Batman and Robin, great scene in Batman and Robin, when Mr. Freeze is with his goons and they're watching The Year Without a Santa Claus and he's making them <laughs> sing the I'm Mr. Freeze. I hope that Mr. Freeze watches a Schwarzenegger movie in the new movie just in the oh. background you got like conan conan on in the background just a subtle little i mean i feel like it's weird to say because of what the batman was but if someone would do it it would be matt reeves because of all the references we got to the 60s show in that movie I there's so, every time i think about I, every time i think about it i'm like man he loved that 60s show and i don't blame him because that's i mean and i said this on i think our spoiler review where I, I, it felt to me like that that was what I liked as a kid, and this is the adult version of that. Like it kind of, it was almost yeah. like I'm like, oh, this grew up with me. Great, let's watch it. And the whole like noir, colorless look of this movie, it would perfectly suit like this Gotham covered in snow is perfectly like a along the lines of what they're doing. Like it wouldn't feel out of place for this tone and this series. No, absolutely. I think it would work. And I think Matt Reeves says he's got an idea for Mr. Fr or he, I don't think he said he had an idea. I think he said he could see how Mr. Free, he has an idea for how Mr. Freeze could fit in, or he, he believes Mr. Freeze could fit into his world. Time's going to tell. I mean, the, my one concern, Andrew, with it going forward is the Penguin show just got picked up. The GCPD show is now the Arkham, has transformed into the Arkham Asylum show. Mm-hmm kind of Catwoman stuff, but nothing seems like they have a full handle on anything. And that's what concerns me because the thing with Peacemaker was, I mean, James Gunn was locked in sure during COVID, but he wrote it, pitched it, shot it. And it was out five, six months after suicide squad. Like that's someone who was committed to an idea, had an idea made that idea a reality and did it. Like, I, like it wasn't just like, oh, you know, it'd be cool, this. It's not, you know, he's not just blowing smoke. He had something tangible there. And my concern is these might not be, it might be putting the cart ahead of the horse, how like Star Wars is just announcing that, uh, what's his name, is writing a Star Wars movie. Like, who cares? I don't <laughs> care anymore. I honestly don't care. It's like the Flash release date. I just don't care anymore. Yeah. When these movies get these TV show spinoffs. It always is just a bunch of red flags for me. It, cause it always sounds like we're getting the dregs <laughs> with these. And I mean, I ended up loving Peacemaker, but whenever these things are announced, it's like even back in the day, like, guess what Marvel fans you're getting an agents of shield show. And I'm like, you mean you've set up this world where there's like a hundred awesome colorful superhero characters and you're going to give us a show about pencil neck agents in a ship fighting terrorists like that sounds so dry and boring i don't care i came here for superheroes don't give me something else and then i felt the same way with when like the peacemaker show was announced obviously before i saw it uh because it's like you know i'm sitting there i'm watching suicide squad i'm having a great time again all these colorful characters you're giving me and these beautiful worlds etc and now you're telling me to get excited for a show about Amanda Waller's IT guy and James Gunn's girlfriend? Like, I don't care. Why do you think that excites me? And obviously the show ended up being great. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clip that and I'm going to leave out the end where you said obviously the show is great. 
But it's like, you know what I mean? These shows, every time they announce these things, it's always the same feeling. It's like, hey, guys, the Batman stuff is great. Now, how about a show about a Gotham police officer working behind a desk? And it, like, why are you, why, why, why do you keep making all these movies about kings and queens and bishops and knights and then trying to get me excited about a show about pawns? Like, it's not going to get me excited. So I always just kind of take a step back when these things get announced, even though the, the Arkham Asylum thing sounds Ten times more interesting than the Gotham yeah. Cops thing, uh, because the Gotham Cops thing was pretty much the show Gotham anyway. Yeah, that confused me. <laughs> yeah, so even though this sounds more interesting and the Penguin show sounds like it could be fun because Farrell's Penguin was awesome, I'm still just taking a step back and I'm like, because to me it's the red flag of why was this story not important enough to be a movie? Uh, and I that's that where I I get hesitant. I think the Penguin one makes sense because it's going to be Scarface, it's going to be Sopranos, like it's going to be like that. Where I think it'll work better as a TV show because I don't think, I you know, Joker aside, I don't think you could coerce people to go see a Penguin movie like this. I, I just, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe if it was really good, but it's different. I don't know. It's so niche. I don't know if you could. Um, and I think giving him time to progress in a TV show would make sense. Arkham Asylum, on the other hand, you could put all of your crazy awesome because it's like. I mean, one thing you said, though, that it's almost contradicting yourself, Andrew, is, I mean, it's not really, but it is, is the Suicide Squad is all nothing characters. Like, there's no character in Suicide Squad. You're like, that's my favorite villain of all time. I mean, Harley Quinn is the one that they've kind of shoved in there. But, but aside from that, like, who the hell cared about any of those other characters? Arkham Asylum could be a, very, a version of that you know, in, in a way where you can have... Uh, Dr. Hugo Strange there. And then I'm still going with Man Bat is like the fly. And that happens in Arkham Asylum. But you can have a bunch of like low tier Batman villains living within Arkham Asylum having a good time. And it could be a, it could be a very unique show that can highlight the villains that would never make it into a, a feature length Batman movie for whatever reason. Either they're too far out there or they're just not appealing enough for people who want to care about watching in a movie, but you could throw them on a show and then make them very intriguing. So I have a lot of hope uh, for that show in that, in that regard. But as for villains in the movies, they've got to be villains that counter the Batman in a way that make him grow as a character and as a person. And obviously the Riddler was perfect for that. Catwoman was really good for that. Penguin um, threw osmosis is the only reason really why he did he's not that connected to bruce wayne he will be eventually i think but at this point in time not so much um so yeah i think i think we've uh established that mr freeze is the only one that works the only one and hey if that show is the only way we get louis the lilac and the minstrel back then yes i'm all for it and uh, nicholas cage as egghead oh he's coming excellent <laughs> idea it's not even a question he's coming I'm curious, I wonder how different, if at all, we would have felt coming out of this movie if we didn't know, if they, like if they had said nothing about a Penguin show. If none of that was made clear to us and they just said, here's this movie. I wonder if we would have um, been, you know, expecting the sequel to be about Penguin or expecting him to have a bigger part. I don't know. Do you think we would have had different conclusions i thought his his well colin Farrell kept coming out saying that his role was small so i was anticipating a smaller role than we got mm -hmm. but that's a good point because i might have believed that he actually was i didn't believe he was a rat there was two reasons why i never believed he was a rat one the penguin show two <laughs> they kept calling falcone falcone yeah which which they were i'm like are you pushing the falcon like as soon as they said a wing i was like oh falcon that's why they're saying falcon i get it now that was the thing i was like why are they saying his name wrong i'm like you got to turo and you're saying it wrong like when we had we had uh what's what's his name in batman begins they said it right at that but now you're saying i couldn't figure it out and then when they said that i was like oh, okay so i see this is where we're headed now you're going okay it's a falcon got it so i, I yeah i think though i might have been more thinking that he would be the rat and then at the end yeah i think i might have thought he would have been the big bad one thing about peacemaker show that i liked was they announced it before suicide squad but they said it's a prequel they were very much like it's a prequel 
and and I bought that it was a prequel because I thought Peacemaker was going to die in the Suicide Squad, and of course he did die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then they obviously brought him back, but so I, I was like, yeah, it's a prequel. And then when I watched this, I was like, oh, it's definitely a prequel. And then I think the minute the movie debuted, it was like, oh no, it's a it's it's a modern day movie with flashbacks. I was like, oh, you son. Yeah, that, that was, was a that smart was move. <laughs> yeah, like the, the Penguin show, like honestly, I think they did that to create excitement and that's the Penguin show and the GCPD show because you always want to create excitement. But DC and Star Wars, you got to stop just saying stuff because no one, no. it's the boy who cried wolf and no one cares anymore. No, this Damon Lindelof thing, I mean, Lost is and always will be one of my favorite shows, but he he has kind of become the kind of writer that makes me cringe now when I when I read his stuff or watch his stuff. So that does not make me excited. Uh, it would have blown my mind in 2010, but now it's just like, eh. and again, Star Wars has lost uh, the right to announce these things anymore. It's just, yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever. And it wasn't an official announcement or anything, but uh, again, yeah. I, I, I don't care. But anyway, Andrew, let's wrap it up. Anything else you want to say on the subject? I'm just glad that Riddler is coming back to be the villain in all three because we know he's the only one that matters. You never know. He could be the big bad in all three. It could be a Riddler trilogy. Oh, my God. And then the third one, you find out that they are related. They're twins separated at birth. We are. They're going to play with his wardrobe the same way they played with Kingpin's wardrobe. And it's going to be a slow burn. But we're going to get him in a green suit and a hat. And I am going to lose my mind. I think we're going to get closer to that. And I think he's going to change his name to uh, Enigma like he does in the comics. That's what I think is going to happen because there's no point in just being Nash. Now he's a, he's an Enigma. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for, Oh, Andrew, plug your book and your channel. <laughs> oh, you mean this book right here? This book side scroller that I wrote. There's my name on it. Wait, no, there's my name on it. Uh, yeah. You can buy side scroller on Amazon right now. And there's an ebook. If you're one of those weirdos, who doesn't like paper, but there's also paperback here. Uh, you gotta, you gotta get it on Cabo. You gotta get it on Cabo. Cabo. One of these days it'll get on Cabo. I gotta, I gotta figure that out. But yeah, you can buy it right now if you like adventure and fun things. It's all here, and it's orange, which automatically makes it a better book than ninety percent of the books out there. It's got yeah. the same color scheme as the Batman. All right, everyone, hey, thank you so much. Uh, give him a subscribe on YouTube, Andrew Fantasia. I uh, buy his book, and until next time, uh, may you be the master of your own universe. Falcone.